So hi folks, uh, welcome to the afternoon sessions um, I'm here at PyCon. Just as a reminder, there's the lightning talks um, at the end of the day. If anybody has some um, uh, lightning talks they'd like to present, um, I believe there's uh, prizes and swag even for the speakers. So if you've got any ideas, um, um, step up and talk to the organizers. Anyway, without further ado, um, this is JD, who's a software developer with OpenUp, um, who do uh, civic tech. Thank you, JD. Thank you. Hi, yes, so I'm JD. Um, we, I work at OpenUp. Uh, we used to be called Code for South Africa. Uh, the problem is people put too much emphasis on the word code. Um, so th the work we do is aimed at sort of empowering people in South Africa to be able to solve their own problems by being informed and knowing how things work and so on. And sometimes code helps this, but it's not really about the code. Um, so now we're called Open Up, uh, hopefully opening South Africa up. I mean, there's so many ways to play with that. Um, so that doesn't work, but that w should work. Cool. So there are three main points to this talk. Um, data is fun, data is dirty, and you can do it. Um, and we'll, we'll go through them now. Yeah, data is fun, bear with me. Um, so we became aware of this data set called the Medicine Price Registry. And uh, it's basically a list of regulated medicine prices in South Africa. Uh, there's a base price and a sort of a percentage margin that the pharmacy can charge for uh, dispensation and tax and you end up with the single exit price which is basically the maximum price people can charge for medicine when they sell medicine in South Africa. Um, and like most government websites, it really inspires you, <laughs> like it's exciting. <laughs> um, but just in the corner there it says SEP databases, single exit price databases. So uh, this wonderful databases is uh, a little Excel file over there, just one. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, and as you notice, this is like 22 megabytes. And I don't know about Excel, I don't know if it's just my computer, but LibreOffice isn't really a big fan of uh, 22 megabyte spreadsheets. Um, and here you have like a, your standard horrendous spreadsheet with like seven different styles going on and locked columns and so on. Um, it really makes you want to play with it and gives you confidence in the data, right? Um, so a, a distinct product would have a, a applicant name, kind of who sells it, not necessarily who manufactures it, but yeah. Um, the product name, like Tamiflu or Panado, and um, different packagings would be different um, products. So sort of 20 tomo uh, tomato, uh, Panado tablets is different from 40 Panado tablets. Um, you get a list of the active ingredients. Some products have multiple uh, ingredients. Um, you get sort of the strength of the, the stuff inside, uh, the dosage, some medication comes as injections or packs of injections and so on. Um, the single exit price varies dramatically. Sometimes it's um, sort of 80 Rand, sometimes it's 3000 Rand, and that so depends very much on what's inside and how many things are inside. So you could have 10,000 tablets in one packaging, or you could have uh, four things that each cost 1,000 Rand. Cancer drugs are expensive, guys. Um, you get the effective date, which came up as a nice integer there, I just noticed, and that's just <laughs> the reality of working with data. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and that's when, when the sort of this price in the spreadsheet was valid. And it says whether the, this product is a, an originator or generic. So is it the people who have the patent to sell this? Or are, are other people now allowed to freely produce this? So what should your medicines cost? Um, that's sort of a pretty obvious um, question. And my colleague had the data set and he had a few hours. So he made a site where you can find cheap drugs. <laughs> Not this one. <laughs> uh, this one. Um, so it's a simple little Django app, and uh, the database is a SQLite file on disk. It works a charm. There's uh, Bootstrap Mint. We didn't have to think too much about making it look sharp. There's a nice little JSON API. Um, we have something like 10,000 products, and search works fine. Um, you can look at what's written on your prescription and see what the pharm is pharmacy is allowed to charge for it. Um, you can also find generic alternatives. It's a bit more complicated than just saying like these two products with the same drugs are equivalent, but that's why there's a pharmacist selling you the drugs um, or dispensing. 
Um, and we know that people use it. And the way we know is that, like, one time the server fell over and a doctor got in touch with us and said, uh, when is this coming back? Because I use it every day. And we asked, okay, how do you use it? Um, no, I, I use it to find cheaper drugs for my, um, sort of my patients who, who are sort of low-income people and can't afford what the doctor necessarily prescribed. Um, so, yeah, it's not really just about finding cheap drugs, though. Um, did you know that your medicines are regulated, or the prices? Um, so, while we have you here on this site, you can learn a little bit, and I think that's quite important, because if we don't really know about the systems that are in place, if those systems get eroded, we're not going to know. <laughs> um, we're not going to realize. So, there's always this element of educating people about what's going on, which I think is quite important. Um, so, um, this is the fun part of this data set, I think, or uh, one of the fun parts. Um, one product can have multiple ingredients, and in Excel that means <laughs> you need one or more rows for the ingredients that go into the product, which is a bit of a pain, but um, it's something we can solve. So, we want to um, import this into our website, for example. Um, Every few months when there's a new data set, you want to load the latest NPR spreadsheet and um, users want to query by name and if they're looking at a product, they want to find other products that are equivalent. Um, so we just open the, the workbook in Python, we loop over the rows. That's simple enough. Um, we want to sort of handle the fact that there's multiple rows per record. So there's a little assumption that sort of if the, the registration number is um, not empty, then it's a new product row. Um, and all the ingredients before it belong to the previous one. So if you hit a new product, just yield the old product because now you're starting a new set of ingredients. Um, and that deals with the fact, so yeah, this is the, um, the product code. No, this is the product code. Um, so it's simple enough, it's nasty in Excel, but it works, and we stick it into a uh, Postgres database, well, SQLite for my colleague. Um, there was a comment, clean some stuff. While you're processing the records, you can do basic cleaning, like fixing the, the wording and fixing typos, or um, skip if there's no, no nappy code. The nappy code is um, what should be the primary key of this data set. Um, and if it's not an integer, then it's invalid. If it's not present, it's invalid, and so on. Um, and if we don't have a price, then it's not relevant to this uh, website. And um, you don't really need to be able to read that. I just think that dicts are pretty, especially when they're syntax highlighted. But once you have sort of a list of ingredients, you stick them into the product, and then we, we store it in the database. Um, and because we just need the latest prices, we delete all the prices uh, every time there's a new data set and loop over them and add the, the new prices and you're done. So, so far so good, or yeah, it's all right, it works. Um, now that the, um, the data set is published, um, well, yeah, so the data set is published periodically, which means we have prices over time, and that could be fun. Um, so to load the prices over time, we need to separate out prices from the product. No big deal. Um, my colleague is just a bit of a hacker, and he just stuck this stuff into SQLite willy-nilly. No migrations, and I'm a klutz, and I want repeatability, and I have no memory, so I don't want to mess with the database. I don't want to learn how SQLite works. Um, so um, I didn't want to upgrade that old version of Django, so I uh, just copied everything over to SQL Alchemy models um, because I also wasn't building a website. I wanted to do more analysis with the data. Um, so I start building my object relational models with SQL Alchemy. Um, like a good little engineer, I don't use a domain-specific primary key, but I just use an integer, and then I add a unique constraint because, you know, I mean, this I want clean data. And um, that starts with the NAPI code, and then I try to import the data, and I hit an error, and it says duplicate key. So two products of the same NAPI code, but different pack size. Fine. Add pack size to the, uh, to the unique constraint. Load the data. Error. Duplicate key. Eventually, I added five different additional things <laughs> to the, the unique constraint. And 
what this shows is the data model is absurd, um, which is fine because the data is absurd, and it's better that we know it and acknowledge it before we do analysis. Um, yeah. So in theory, the NAPI <laughs> uh, code is, is a unique identifier. In practice, there are variations all over the data set. Um, and for two or more versions of a product, which one is the correct one? Um, perhaps we can use the odd one out if there's multiple versions of the same thing and some of them are the same. Um, but perhaps that one was the correction of all the other ones. So it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, hindsight is 2020. At this stage, I should have stopped and um, just counted, like, for how many products is this column wrong? And for how many col co products is this column wrong? Um, if it's only a few, you can fix it by hand. Um, this is a data set of about 10,000 or 20,000 rows. So um, if it's a lot, then you're not going to fix it by hand. Um, OK, so other fields are easier to clean. Um, if you don't know about it and you work with data, you should. Open Refine is an awesome tool. It can do a lot more, but in this case, it was just the obvious choice. So we want to clean up the names because which name do you want to show, which name is the right name, and sometimes you want to use the name for example identifying the same ingredient. Just pretty obvious things sometimes, but um, sometimes there are more interesting variations like people who can't quite write Latin but they think they can. Um, so Open Refine just has a thing, you find your column, you say cluster, you can choose different algorithms and like tweak some parameters you get an overview of what the cluster looks like, choose your sort of final thing to normalize to, and now everything is consistent um, in that column, which is nice. I mean, there might be issues still that, that the clustering things didn't find, but this is, a, this is very effective. And you can export uh, this as JSON, so you can use it programmatically, or you can just import it so that next time you have more data, you just apply the same ones, and then you don't have to go through the whole clustering process again. Um, so uh, what about medicine prices over time? Um, it would be nice to write queries that tell us how the medicine market behaves over time. Like, what's the average number of competitors for a product or for a drug? Um, how much does competition affect the price? Or, but yeah, we know there are errors. We're not sure of the extent of them, which means General statements like this, you can't say like with a certainty of 80% or whatever. Um, you just can't make these statements. Um, so what do you do? Um, well, it'd be interesting to track the, the price of a product over time. Um, since the, so yeah, the unique constraint was so broad that you know that you might have a series of a product, but you might be missing a part of the series that carries on under another product. Um, so, you, yeah, it just becomes very clear that um, you can say very limited things about, uh, about the sort of the series of a product. So data is dirty. We're accepting it. Um, what can we do? Um, it's impractical to, um, to answer so it might be impractical to answer the question you set out to answer. That's fine. Pivot. Data isn't perfect. Go find candidates. I like the word candidates. Go find candidates of interesting stories. Um, so we want to look at equivalent products easier, more, more easily. So we... Um, uh, I need to just catch my breath. I'm running. Um, yeah. So... An equivalent product is basically the same set of ingredients in the same quantity um, and the same name. So we make something we call the equivalence key. Um, because in the website it was fine, you just find sort of um, products with the same number of ingredients and then you find the same set and it's a database query and stuff. But when you want to look at 10,000 products at the same time and you're messing around in Jupyter Notebook, you don't want to wait 10 minutes to cluster or everything. Um, so you just make an equivalence key that um, is a little string that like, lets you group by things. And if you export the data as a CSV, you can take it into other product, uh, other tools and still group it um, without doing complex uh, SQL queries. Um, 
And you get this nice little thing where you can have a dictionary and the key would be the equivalence key, like the name and the uh, strength, and a list of products that are equivalent for this definition. Um, and first I implemented this as a property, um, which is nice and cute, but it's too slow when you're playing around in Jupyter again. So I just calculate it and cache it in the database. And I say cache because I don't like sort of this is duplicating information that is in the database. But I mean, we're just experimenting, so this is okay. Um, and Jupyter Notebook really is your friend. I, I don't use it enough. Uh, if you don't know about it, you need to be using it for experimentation and, and things. If you've ever used pandas in sort of the command line, don't. <laughs> It, it doesn't make sense what you get out of it, but it, so it's really much easier to use pandas in Jupyter. Um, and um, I never remember how to use anything. I don't remember how to query uh, SQL Alchemy. So m your notebook has to start with sort of opening something from the database anyway. So, and I just add my Jupyter notebook to Git. You, it's got all of your history, so it's, it's just so much easier. So yeah, you can get some queries, some products, um, look at the ingredients, the, the data model works, cool. Um, then you can pick some random, massive, long equivalence key and look at sort of the different prices. You see different prices for different products. Okay, the data model works. Um, so you have a suspicion. Um, what happens when a generic enters the market after an originator? And remember, we only have a window of, of data. So the data has been published for, for years now, but we only have sort of from, we started capturing the data. Um, so just because a, um, yeah, that's fine. Um, but I wrote this horrible loopy stuff and I get out that there's, in the data set, there's only 253 where the generic act actually entered the market um, later than the, um, the equivalence key, uh, later than the, the originator. Um, and yeah, so the, the window thing just means that, I mean, a generic always enters the market after the originator, that's the definition, but because the sort of beginning is sliced off, um, uh, these are the ones where we can really say, okay, if the generic came in later, what does that mean? Um, and it's still a lot of data. Uh, the reason you need to do experiments like this is because sort of 5,000 products, um, all of the data together, the equivalents, th there are 5,000 groups of equivalent products. And that's too much for you to sort of reasonably explore. Um, but if you have sort of uh, hunches where there might be interesting things, you can reduce the, the, the data set. And um, now you can focus on that and see, okay, if I can manually inspect 200 groups, and I'll show you how in a minute. Um, so this is how we end up sort of looking for interesting things. You just plot it. You've got a group of products, and for each product you have a series of its prices, um, and you, it takes a while. You can do this in uh, Jupyter Notebook, uh, and the charts just come up there, so you don't have to open a file the whole time. Um, and it takes a while to figure out sort of what's the right legend, and because w there's so much information there, and you then you have to start abbreviating things. So um, Jupyter really saved my saved me there. So this is a chart for one um, um, one group, and this doesn't necessarily mean anything, but because we've sorted the keys. Um, you've got similar products that aren't the same, but they're related next to each other. Um, so you can start, you can't put everything on the same chart, it's just not going to work. Um, but your favorite sort of image viewer, normal image viewer, will just usually, if you press left and right, go along alphabetically so you can see these two are similar, um, or th at least they contain the same drug, so they might be related and see if there's any pattern. Um, and then you can go along, I mean, this is about 20 drugs on, 20 images on, and 
this is this looks interesting. So now you can go and look deeper into this drug, um, which is really exciting when you start finding them. Um, but I mean, if you were to write some some code to do that analysis, you're going to be making mistakes and it's going to be complex and it's going to be confusing. And I mean, I don't know. You guys are probably better at sort of doing window analysis, or I don't know what the what it means, but. Um, my eyes just tell me that there's something going on there, like there's a price drop, that's exciting. Um, so just use your eyes, visualize something and explore more. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, the charts get, get, gets complex very quickly. Um, so there are inconsistencies in how strings are recorded. Um, sometimes the strength is repeated in the product name what does, um, I don't know why there's a two mil or two dash mil, I think they've sort of put the right thing, the wrong thing in the wrong cell. Um, what's the difference between 50 milligrams per one mil, 50 milligrams per mil? It doesn't matter. The charts are side by side. Your eyes will put them together. Um, you don't need to clean all of this data perfectly to just make it work perfectly before you can get some value out of it. Um, so, yeah, um, and it's really important to reduce the, the data set before you start doing manual sort of verification of things. Um, we worked with a journalist who really wanted it to be sort of perfect and you have to keep coming back to the fact that you're not going to be able to make the data, data perfect. So you have to reduce the size and a smaller set of data. You can sort of do manual verification on. So this isn't just a um, cheeky plug of one of our other products, but if you search for some of these um, drugs, you'll find registration documents in the National Gazettes, um, which are published in public domain. And in theory, you can scrape the information from the PDFs. If you've tried that, <laughs> it's horrific. Um, but that's why you need to reduce the size. And then don't do manual verification on 200 things. Do it on 10 things. Find one product where there's an interesting story and look those things up. Because that, you can go and ask someone and go, OK, this is the exact number. So for all of these five years, I can fix that in Excel. Um, but it's very expensive, so don't try to make your data perfect. Um, so yeah, excitedly, we send the, a big folder of images to, to our partners working on this project. And uh, got an email, JD, what's this? There's this massive file name. This is impossible. It's meaningless. And yeah, sometimes that assumption that the, the, a new product code means it's a new product uh, doesn't work because they didn't put the product code in. And uh, then you start adding a whole bunch of ingredients to the wrong, um, to the wrong product, and it's kind of meaningless. And that's okay. You can discover that, and you can fix it. And it's probably going to happen again, because you've made an assumption, and the data isn't perfect, and there's 20,000 rows in that spreadsheet. So don't assume that the data is perfect. It's just the data is dirty. Accept it. Um, be subservient to the data, um, respect it, <laughs> but but have fun. <laughs> uh, really, you can do it. Um, I just showed you. It's messy. That's okay. Uh, it's not like the textbook makes it look. Um, just play with it, and you'll find interesting things to do in no time. Um, and um, I don't know what this is. Enhance. Just showing you. There's more data there. Enhance. Ooh, non-cooperative company list. Um, yeah, so data's fun. I've never played with a data set and not gotten excited about its potential. Um, you'll, you'll find stories in the data you never expected. Just be open, open-minded and, and dive in. Be cynical as well. Question everything. Why is this so? Um, there's a story there. Like, there's a story in the mistakes just like there's a story in the data. Um, Data is dirty, and it's OK, and you're going to have to learn to compromise. Uh, sorry about your beautiful data model. That's why I put the stuff into uh, Alembic, so that I could change my data model all the time as I'm learning about it and, and as the model has to change. And when you're just doing analysis, you can reload the data. So you don't always have to write very nice sort of 
data manipulation in your migrations. But um, yeah, just use Alembic. Don't be afraid of database migrations. Um, and iteratively develop your questions based on what's really interesting. You might start out with questions that you thought were awesome, but um, you're going to have to focus on what's, what's necessary and what's practical. And you can do it. There's great tooling. Code only when you need to. Like I said, we've taken code out of our name because coding isn't always the, the solution. Um, get familiar with pivot tables. Use your favorite spreadsheet program. Open Refine. CSV Kit is a great command line tool as well as a library. Um, when you need to, code. Don't be afraid to. It's hard to strike that balance. Try out pandas. The syntax is frustrating. Um, but when you get it right, it's very powerful. And a colleague verified a lot of my confusion with pandas without sticking everything in the database. So having multiple methods is, is also useful. Um, yeah. Um, and go to the shell programming talk. I think it's later this afternoon. Um, I think that's going to be quite useful as well. Um, so if you want to play with this stuff, I'm lucky enough to get paid to do this, but I also do it for fun. Um, join our community. It's happening all around the country. Um, so tonight there's a Codebridge community evening in um, the southern suburbs in, in Kenilworth. Um, there's also Codebridge Durban Lab. Uh, there's a guy there who can tell you more. Um, there's Hacks Hackers in Joburg. Uh, start your city's community. I want to see Codebridge in um, And find your tribe. We're on Slack, so you can chat with people who are interested in, in hacking for good. Also, we're hiring. Well, thank you, JD. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, any questions from the audience? You said that you was working with journalists. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have like, did you find any really cool edge case on a particular molecule that proved that assumption that are right? And you can show us maybe? Did I prove what, sir? Like um, you said that you was working with journalists. So I guess that you was trying to find like edge case on certain molecule and prove that maybe generic are more expensive than the, oh, yeah. did you have like a cool that's coming soon, yeah. So <laughs> I, I tried very hard not to give away her scoops. <laughs> um, but but uh, yeah, keep, keep an eye out. Thank you. That was very interesting and very useful. Um, what do you do about missing data? How do you deal with that when you've got prices or ingredients missing from some products and you want to include the product in your, in your analysis? Yeah, so there's always the p potential for other sources of the data. Um, and you can also just use filler values. I mean, when you're just drawing charts, if it's hopefully your missing data is in the middle if it's for one product. Um, I mean, it, it really depends, but um, it sounds like I'm, I'm a parrot but it or, a, or a stuck record. But if, you, if it's a small enough set, you can manually go and speak to people and find the facts. If it's a big data set, then you really have to find a good quality data set. Yeah, thanks. Um, your talk was a lot about um, acceptance, yes, okay. <laughs> but did you try lobbying um, on the data entry side to actually provide other than the Excel sheet? Then I didn't catch the so question, did I? On the data entry side, did you try lobbying actually for uh, some proper, um, yeah, a proper format and um, yeah, not um, as much uh, confusion there? Um, did you try lobbying on the mm. uh, government side there? So I think... Uh, we're, we're in touch with, with the people working with this data, producing the data, um, but I'm not in the strategy so, so much. And I think what I didn't make clear was the context here is I had a few days. What can we do with this data in a few days? So, um, yeah, of, of course. You, we w and as an organization, we now work with government quite a lot to help them just work more effectively and, uh, yeah. So, uh, so th I think uh, in South Africa, I was talking to the uh, Zimbo Pi people, um, comparing notes. And in South Africa, we're so lucky where we have a government who do sometimes actually work with us. And um, I in Zimbabwe, that sounds like that's <laughs> just a dream. But the project is going on for quite a while now, isn't it? 
so the website's been up for a while. Um, this this sort of stretch of analysis was just a few d few days of of work to to see if we can get stories out. Um, but I mean, the data is not going anywhere. Um, so it, it's a it's an open source project. You're welcome to jump in. I was just wondering if you know how how the up and up upstream how they process that data. Are they entering things manually to generate those Excel spreadsheets, or um, who the, the the people making the, the data? government? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it it looks like it. I believe this is the authoritative source, and people manually like looking at some of the mistakes. There are typos and stuff all over. So, yeah, this is literally how they maintain it. I think someone has a password, and then they can unlock it, and then... <laughs> um, just to also part of that question, that I don't think that's the authoritative data. There are actually companies in the country that maintain those prices. So you, but I'll speak to you afterwards about who they are, cool. um, where you can get better data probably from. Exciting. Thank you. Interestingly on that, the, there's an organization or a company whose job it is to um, to maintain the NAPI codes and my colleague just tried to verify our data against that and there were a lot of things I think that NAPI codes we had that weren't in the current NAPI code list and they weren't in the discontinued NAPI code list. So where did these codes come from? Um, also I learned later that the NAPI codes actually can be broken up in two parts and the one part is sort of equivalent within a manufacturer and the other part is uh, different packagings of that, um, which might have helped the analysis. But I mean, when you have a few days, you have to do the best you can and that's why you have to prioritize. You're never going to have perfect knowledge. Sorry, that's me. <laughs> well, JD, thank you very much. Okay, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. I've also been along to some of the, the CodeBridge meetings um, just down the road here, um, and uh, Civic Tech, yay! <laughs>